I, it's, a, it's a wonderful to be here. I, 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 I have been remiss in that I have not been to Prague for, for a decade. So it was, it's wonderful to be back in Prague and it's wonderful to, to be in this fancy new institute. And um, so I think because, because there is various types of people here, there are some vision people, some graphics people, and some, uh, um, some others that learning, non-learning, I'm going to give you kind of um, an overview of some of the stuff that we have been doing, uh, but don't go into too much detail uh, because that might be too boring for others and, and, and maybe uh, too much for, uh, for some. Uh, but then I'm, I'm here the rest of the day, so I'm happy to, to chat about these things more. Um, so, of course, you know how it is with, 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 with professors, you know. All the work is done by the graduate students and the postdocs who are amazing, and then the professor just puts together the slides and, 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 and presents the work. And in this case, actually, even the slides, most of them have been done by the, by the graduate students. So I'm really just an just a audio uh, recording of really the, all the wonderful work that, that, that they have been doing. Um, so if, probably if you didn't live under a rock for the last few years, you have heard of the deep networks and how they have revolutionized computer vision. And um, kind of the standard classic way of doing this is, it's basically a classic supervised learning problem. You are giving a network, which you can think of as a big black box, uh, a pairs of input images and output labels, X, Y pairs. Okay, and this big black box, essentially, you can think of it as memorizing uh, uh, um, these these the score occurrence or the the it, it's memory it's modeling the associations between the x's and the y's. Okay, and of course you need to have lots and lots and lots of these training pairs, so you have lots of people clicking on a bunch of images, lots of you know millions of images, and what do they uh, what is their labels? And once you have uh, um, trained on millions of these uh, pairs of images and labels, then given a new image, this magic black box can tell you what label it is. And this is what supervised, direct supervised learning, uh, and is in particular deep learning, has been all about. Okay, but there is, are some problems that that I will mention of this beautiful story. One obvious problem is that this, this labeling bit is very expensive. Millions of images don't come cheap. You have to have people actually label them. And for every new problem, you need to label more images. So that's, that's, that's a problem of cost. But there is also another problem that is a little bit more subtle. And here is an illustration of this. So here is an image that is basically, you can think of it as a texture synthesized version of the original image. Basically, some of the pixels have been moved around in certain ways, but to kind of to preserve the kind of the statistics of the of, 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 of the image. It's uh, it's it's actually work by by Leon Gattis. Okay, so we change the input, but the neural network is perfectly ha happy to still call it a collie. In fact, I can give you other random images like this. Right, and it's still basically happy to call it by that same class collie. Okay, and um, what this suggests is that this magical uh, black box, the kind of evolutional neural network, is not actually doing that much. It's not doing what we think of com a lot of computer vision should be all about. It's not doing you know figure ground detection. It's not finding the 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 uh, you know the 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 foreground region. It's not finding the dog. It's not segmenting the dog out from the background. It's not doing any of the foreground, background, or occlusion reasoning. None of that. It doesn't need to do any of that because it probably just looks at the snout and a couple of eyes and then says, "Oh yeah, that's a collie," okay, and maybe some his, uh, color histogram. So it doesn't need to work super hard to solve this problem, okay. And this is, you know, a cause for worry. 
Because in this particular case, this is ImageNet uh, classification task, so you have a thousand classes. And so maybe this is not, maybe you don't need to work that hard because you might not need to have, uh, to, 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 to really worry about, oops. What's going on here? You, you might not need to worry about finding the boundaries of objects, so even reasoning about objects, uh, with only a thousand classes. But the, the issue is that we don't really have more than a thousand classes labeled, and so in the end, what this magical neural network is doing, it's not really object detection. It's really more like texture classification. It's classifying dog texture, collie texture. So this, if, 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 if you know, 1,000 way classification task is the only thing you want to do, maybe this is not so bad. But here is an example of, uh, of something that, you know, uh, 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 Joseph and, 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 and a lot of us have been worried about uh, uh, for a long time, uh, action recognition, okay? Action recognition, the same thing, but in time. So you, you have, um, you have a, a, a video and you want to recognize what action is being performed. And the one very weird result in action classification has been that giving more frames of video to the classifier did not seem to improve performance. That just a single frame, oh, you thank you, me? perfect. A single frame is, is good enough. So do, do you want to also switch? Ah, all right. Oh, okay. Then, all right. Look at that. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, for example, so you basically, for a single frame, you do basically just as well. And this was a big, strange result that people don't know why it was so. But if we look at, for example, here is an opening fridge action. So you go to the fridge, you extend your hand, you pull on the fridge door, you open the fridge, and then you close it, right? And you want to recognize other actions that are opening fridge actions, okay? If you run a classifier for this task, you label a whole bunch of opening the fridge actions as positives, and then uh, uh, others as negatives, you train your network, and then if you look at what, the performance is great, by the way. The performance is very, very good, but if you look at which frames did the classifier actually pay attention to, it's just this one. So it doesn't care, it doesn't track the hand, it doesn't care about uh, the, the fridge door. Really, all it cares about is, again, it's the texture of an open refrigerator, okay? And once it sees an open refrigerator texture, it knows, oh, this must be a fridge opening action, what else could it be, right? So again, it's, it's taking the easy way out. It's being lazy because it doesn't have to work hard, okay? And maybe if you asked me a year or two ago, you know, how do we deal with this problem, I would say that this is all an issue of a data set bias, that the only pictures of opening refrigerators are in this opening fridge action, so let's add some negative images of just opened fridges, like from, from you know, maybe Amazon uh, product search, and then everything will be fine. Now I'm starting to think that while data set bias is a problem, it's not the whole problem, because in a sense, this data set bias will never go away. It's, there is no way, the, the, data, um, the data is finite. So we'll never be able to fix all the holes. There will always be a way to cheat because if there is a finite amount of data, there is always a way to, to find a, a path that, that, is, that is somehow you know, cheating through the data. Um, and, and so it's, it's, there is, it's kind of like playing a, you know, this game, children's game of whack you you, know, you you push something down and something else pops up, okay? Um, and, and also, if you think, of, if you ask a machine learning people about it, this, this is not even their problem. Because the machine learning people say, look, you train on the training set, 
And then you've evaluated on the validation set of your method, of your data set. Okay, so you take your data set, you split it into two, the training and the test set. And as long as it does well on the test set, you're fine, right? And the test set comes from the same distribution as the training set, so it's the same statistics. What we have here is that we want to test our algorithms on something that's not really in the, in the test set of the, uh, of the data set. That's something else. So we train on, say, detecting cars from, from an ImageNet data set, but then we want to go out on the street and, and, and detect cars there. And the cars on the street don't really have the same distribution as the cars that you were trained on. But we still want to do it. So in a sense, our problem is actually quite somewhat different than the problem in machine learning. That we actually do want to test on things we never really trained on. So we want it to really be general. And so the way forward I see is that somehow we need to better use the data we have. There is no hope to ever get all the data that we um, that 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 will make the problem perfectly con uh, uh, concrete, but we need to somehow use the data that we have better. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples of the way I think about it. So, in in a, you can think of it as as a a way that a well-run country is run compared to a badly run countries run. It's not that in a well-run country you cannot cheat the laws. Of course you can. But the system is set up in such a way that it's actually more expensive to cheat than to follow the law. Okay? And so even though you can cheat, you don't do it because it's not in your self-interest. In a poorly run country, it's cheaper to cheat so everybody cheats and there is no way you, no, there is nothing you can do about it. Okay? So we need to somehow set up our problem in such a way that it's more expensive for the network to cheat, that it, the easiest thing the network can do is to do the right thing. That's, that's the goal, okay? And if you think about the way that we do this direct supervised learning, input image, output label, and just train on these pairs, that just sets up, sets up uh, your, your life for cheating because, um, so in, 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 uh, in my class, you know, we have uh, a whole semester worth of material, and then at the end of the semester, there is the final exam. So of course, most people don't do anything during the whole semester. The night before the exam, they, they look at some exams from previous years, and they try to memorize this, you know, the question and the answer, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, right? And they, they basically memorize the whole, all of this set of, uh, of question and answer pairs, and then they go to the exam, and actually they do pretty well, right? This is not a bad strategy to pass the final exam. It's a bad strategy if you actually want to learn the material, but it's not a bad strategy to pass the exam because you know, I'm lazy, I'm going to make the, the exam this year to be not that different from the exam last year. In any case, there is very small set of problems you can ask that is easy to grade, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so this kind of memorization of question, answer, question, answer, it's actually the correct thing to do if your goal is to pass the exam. But of course, our goal is not to pass the exam. Our goal is to, to actually learn the material. So how do you learn the material? How do you actually learn you know, uh, 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 arithmetic, for example, when you're a little kid? To really learn it, what you do is you don't give yourself question-answer pairs. You look at the question, you try really hard to solve it, and then once you solve it, you got some answer, you go to the back of the book to compare it with, them, with the right answer. And then that's how you kind of try to update yourself, okay? And so basically that's the kind of idea that, that we want to try to push our computers to do, to try to study harder, to try to learn things that are more generalizable, that are not just good enough to pass the, the test, but to actually understand the, the, the world, okay? So that's kind of the, the preamble, and uh, the, the way we have been working on this in, in, in my uh, lab is, we have been doing it in three different paths, and I'm just going to uh, kind of quickly show some of the, some of the results in that. So the first is self-supervision, the idea of not having 
a expert tell you the correct answer, but let the computer figure out the correct answer. Second is what we call meta supervision. It's, I'm not sure how standard this term is. I think we might just have came up with it. Uh, and the idea here is that you don't supervise the data, the correct answer. You supervise how the answer is supposed to behave. Okay? And finally, if there is time, I also want to mention a little bit about, you know, what if there is no correct answer? What if you're just learning by just playing around? You know, if you don't have a goal, there is, no, there is nothing to cheat. There is no need to cheat because you're just playing around. There is no goal. And so the idea here is to see if we just get, remove the goal, remove the, you know, the, whatever, whatever we're trying to optimize, and see if we can just, just play and be curious, can that get, get us some uh, representation that's more generalizable, okay? So I'm gonna show some examples of all of these in the next, oops, all right, okay. So first is self-supervision. Here is a evocative drawing by Escher of what we mean here. Um, and this is something that actually kind of had been classic in, 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 in deep machine learning uh, uh, under the heading of representation learning. So we basically want to somehow have a compact representation of an input image, and we want to compute this representation maybe without any labels. And the kind of classic way to do this is uh, what's called an autoencoder, which says, let's have a representation that is small, okay, so there is a bottleneck here, but that if we unpack it, uncompress it, we can reconstruct the original input, okay? And then you train this kind of a, a autoencoder setup for many, many, many images, but you don't, have any, you don't need any labels here, right? It's just, just pairs, of, uh, just, just a single image. Um, and this is, this is a very influential idea. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually work in practice. The representation that you learn here, if you're doing it for any kind of real data, like a, a big image, for example, not a tiny you know, 32 by 32 image, but a big image, that doesn't actually work, okay? Uh, and the reason it doesn't work is that this is, you can think of it really as data compression, right? You're compressing your data, but, and data compression is related to machine learning, but it's not quite the same because data compression doesn't care about how do you perform on new images. It only cares about how you compress the training images that you got. And so what we propose to do is to think about this in terms of not data compression, but data prediction to make the computer try to work harder and say, instead of just compressing the data, let's see if we can train it to predict the data. So one way to do this, a very simple way, is you only give it half of the input signal and you train it to predict the other half. So now it's not just a compression, it's not just that you're taking the pixels and compressing them. You need to think a little bit more. You need to think about context and what should go well with, with the input that you got, okay? And one very simple way of doing this is to split the data in terms of color and, uh, and, and, and luminance. So this was our paper a few years back where we said, okay, let's take, let's take a color image, separate it into a luminance channel and a chrominance channel, and then train a network to predict from the grayscale to the the color, and then, you know, you can get a nice, beautiful image, but hopefully also you learn a representation that is actually meaningful and somehow captures something about the natural world, okay? So, of course, need to show some pictures first, so it actually does learn a reasonably good representation of color, but the cool thing that suggests that maybe it's also learning something else is some of the failures. So here is a couple of instructive failures. Can somebody see what the failure is? It's, let me. What? The ear. The ear. The ear is a little bit off, but it's. A, but somebody said the tongue. Do you see the tongue? There is no tongue, and yet. It's, it's, point, it's coloring it, it pink. Why, could this, why would this be? Well, we were confused too, but then we looked at the training data. And in the training data, these poodles, they all have their tongues out. So 
if this was just some stupid compression, it would not, this, this error would not happen. But here it seems like the network is actually recognizing that this is a dog. It's recognizing the breed of the dog. It's remembering the, the similar dogs it has seen before. And then it's making a mistake, but it's a reasonable mistake that maybe if all the dogs have, have their tongues out in the training set, maybe that's also true in the test set. OK? Um, and indeed, so if we could, you know, we, we did a various uh, tests, but I'll just show you one way to, to see what's, what's been learned in this representation is to, to do what we call deep net electrophysiology. So we kind of probe the different uh, features of that compressed representation and see what they, where we, they fire. Think of them like neurons firing. So where do they fire? And so what we found is that there is a, we found a neuron that fires only on faces. There is another neuron that only finds and fires on dog faces. Another one that fires on flowers, okay? So it's basically, it was able to kind of disentangle from mass of pixels of the input. It was able to, to find the kind of specialized neurons for different, different parts of, 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 of the visual world, even though the labels we had were just the color. It was, it's a very, very weak label and a way, label that, that, that didn't have any semantics in it. And yet we are basically getting something out that is semantic, okay? And so this is, this is kind of a hopeful direction. It's, the representation is not as good as uh, all the kind of semantic uh, trained representations yet, but I still feel that it is, it is op optimistic direction because hopefully it might be more general in, in the long run. But this is still to be, to be, to be found out. Um, originally, actually, this concept of self-supervised learning, one of the early papers in the, by uh, psychologist Virginia Dessa was on thinking about it in terms of the different modalities of, of the sensory signal. So instead of saying, okay, color versus grayscale, although that, that's true, is kind of biologically plausible. You have the rods and the cones, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, rods and the cones, and you can say that the rods and the cones kind of co-train each other. But it's much more reasonable to think about it in terms of different modalities, for example, sight and sound, okay? So the idea here is that, you know, you learn about cows by seeing the cow, hearing the moo, associating those two together, and using that as a kind of learning signal, okay? And so uh, just uh, recently, uh, we decided we're going to uh, try, to, try to use self-supervised learning in this, in this domain. And this is one motivation for why this kind of, this kind of thing is, 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 is a need. At any one moment, we are being bombarded by sensory information. Our brains do a remarkable job of making sense of it all. It seems easy enough to separate the sounds we hear from the sights we see. But there is one illusion that reveals this isn't always the case. Ba, ba, ba. Have ba, a look at this. Ba, what do you ba. hear? Ba, ba, ba. Ba, yes? B A. Ba, ba, ba. But look what ba, happens ba, when we change the picture. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba. And yet, ba, the sound hasn't changed. In every clip, you are only ever hearing ba with a B. It's an illusion known as the McGurk effect. Take another look. Concentrate first on the right of the screen. Now to the left of the screen. The illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing. In the illusion, um, what we see overrides what we hear. 
So um, the mouth movements we see as we look at a face can actually influence what we believe we're hearing. If we close our eyes, we actually hear the sound as it is. If we open our eyes, we actually see how the mouth movements can influence what we're hearing. Ba, ba. So did, did, did people hear? I, I wonder how it works for non-English speakers. So Very far. All this far bar and the center is all the same. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I think that some, some of it is speci specific to English speaker, that the f sound, f, is, is you, you make your mouth like this, f, right? And so even though the sound is exactly the same, the lips move very differently. And so your brain, uh, how many people got the, the effect? How many people heard the fa? OK, mo very good, very good. So it seems to be working, very good, right? So this motivates the idea that if you want a representation, for example, a video representation, you want to combine the visual and the audio, and you probably want to combine it pretty early. This is, this is a very kind of powerful effect, even if you know about the effect. If you're very well aware, you just stare at this thing all the time, you, you cannot turn it off. It is very, very powerful, low-level effect. And so this suggests that the, the coupling of audio and video probably happens pretty early on. And so the idea that we had was to cre create a video representation that takes in audio and visual features at the same time, OK? So kind of classic video representations, you basically have some, some way to go from a series of frames to a representation, and then also the same thing for, for audio. And what we propose is to, to combine it together and then have a joint audio and video representation you know, uh, uh, for, uh, for a number of layers at the top so that the, this information can kind of cook together and get us a, a joint audio-video representation. Okay? But how do we train this representation? And again, we want to train it on, without supervision, with self-supervised training. So one thing that was kind of the obvious first idea that we had was why don't we train, say, a binary classifier where the positives are videos with the correct sound and negatives are videos with a wrong sound, a, a sound from some other video, for example. Okay? And then we train this classifier and hopefully it will learn to, to figure out that the correct sound, correct video, correct sound, there is a correspondence, OK? This, unfortunately, doesn't work well at all. And the reason it doesn't work well at all is because, again, it's a problem of cheating. Because if you, have, if you take a random video and a random audio, the video could be me giving a talk. And the audio could be you know, some sort of a uh, uh, you know, sound from the restaurant, for example, right? You just look at the picture, you look at the people sitting and listening, and you know that this, this is not a restaurant. So just, just to look at the overall uh, uh, picture, just a single frame will be enough to tell you, you know, this is a presentation, that is a restaurant, that is a rock concert. So you don't even need to listen to anything. You can just uh, have a kind of a one, uh, one label which says, okay, this is a restaurant or a rock concert. So we need, again, to try to make the computer work harder. And so here is our also simple idea, too. And the idea, too, is that we're going to have as positives, again, videos with the correct sound. But as negatives, we're going to have that same video, that same audio, but we're going to displace it in time a little bit. Okay? Now this becomes a much harder problem to solve because it's the audio is correct, the video is correct. The only thing that's not correct now is that there is a little bit of a time lag. So the representation really needs to very carefully pay attention to, to, the, to, to the registration between, between those two, okay? So here is the idea. So the correct, uh, uh, the correct samples, the aligned samples are just, you know, audio and video together, okay? And then, and then incorrect ones, almost the same, except 
couple of seconds displaced. And we have to be, we have to be careful because, uh, uh, because um, if you displace for maybe like a second or less than a second, humans are actually not even that sensitive to it. So it needs to be um, a little bit of, uh, of, 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 of uh, displacement. Okay, so now we train this representation for a long, long time, you know, weeks of GPU time. <laughs> And then we have a representation that has the whole thing working. Oh, it's right here. Oop. Uh, the whole thing working, and then we can, think, we can look at what we can do with that representation. So one thing we can do is we can now visualize the source of the sound. Because what we can do is we can say, okay, given this task, of, you know, is it, is it aligned or not aligned? We can actually just use the kind of classic, class activation visualization maps to see what pixels is it using to tell if things are aligned or not. Because those are the pixels that are the sound producing pixels, okay? So here is an example of some of the places where it thought those were the important places. I don't know what's good enough. Uh, uh, that it's, that's, it decided were the sound producing places and here is some some, uh, uh, some visualizations of this over time. Okay. So, and this is again, completely automatic, no labels of any kind, okay? Another thing we can do is we can just plug this in into your standard kind of action recognition data set. A lot of those data sets have audio in them. So we thought, okay, can we use this audio channel to improve uh, our, our method? And we are actually definitely getting improvement over audio uh, and we are improving other self-supervised method we're still not as good as something that is kind of trained with lots and lots of relevant semantic data. But again, the hope is that as we get to harder and harder data sets, that semantic labels will be harder and harder to get. And so the self-supervised methods hopefully will get uh, better. Okay. And finally, uh, 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 kind of a, a cool, fun uh, thing we could do is to see if we can do off on screen separation of the audio sources. So an example would be if you have a speaker speaking in on to the camera and then there's somebody else speaking that is not being seen. Our feature is only going to focus on the on the speaker that is being seen and so we can subtract away the speaker who is not being seen. Okay? So let's let's see what I so Unfortunately, we thought, oh, this is such a cool idea. Nobody would ever think about it. At the same time, like four more groups were basically doing the same thing. Uh, luckily, we heard about each other in time, so we actually cross-sided, and it's all, it's all fine. Um, our method, th most of these folks actually, that was the goal of their paper. So they kind of, they, they basically worked on that particular problem. For us, it's just basically one application of our feature that just kind of falls out of our method. So we'd say that we are kind of a, it's, it's more of an application of our stuff, uh, but hopefully we are also able to, to do other, other things as well. Um, and the idea here is basically we take our representation and then we seed it into kind of a, a standard encoder decoder representation that starts with a sp uh, spectrogram and basically learns to separate it into, into things that part of the spectrogram that have evidence in the image or in the, in the video and the part that does not have evidence in the video. And then you, can, then you can play either one or the other, right? Once you separate, you can play either one. And so here is an example. Been asking you about them because they're not interesting facts to you. That's not true. I have plenty of questions on and immigration. They're, they're, You've attempted to filibuster by talking about your flight. No, I'm not. I, no, I want to. So there's a bunch of people talking. One is off screen, one is off screen. Let's see what we can do. So this is just the on screen. Been asking you about them because they're not interesting facts to you. 
And there, and there were some people. About. No, I'm not. I don't want to. Okay. And this is the off screen. That's not true. I have plenty of questions on immigration. You've attempted to filibuster by talking about your flights with the president. No. So there is there is a little bit of uh, uh, noise there, but mostly it does the right thing. Here is a synchronous translation. Unshakable Japan-U.S. alliance. Thank you so much. Thank. Okay, and this is. Meno yurinai kizuna o sekai ni katte shimesu koto ga dekita to omemasu. Donald, thank you so much. We're able to show to the rest of the world the unshakable Japan-U.S. alliance. Thank. Okay. You're saying that no, no, no. Let me finish my question. We have both speakers here. Okay, what's going on here? Because you're saying that they're not true. And we can, we can hide one of the speakers and then. No, their, no, no. Let me finish my question. Their voices gets away. Okay. All right. We can even do some kind right. of laughter. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Most of it is gone, but not all. Okay. So, so that is uh, that is kind of a various ways of trying to get data to supervise itself and hopefully learn the representation that, that, is, that is, you know, useful for other tasks. The second topic I want to mention briefly is what we call meta-supervision. And the idea here is instead of telling what the correct answer should be, we tell how that correct answer should behave. So what do I mean by that? So the kind of the direct supervision is a um, the direct supervision is uh, is you have input x and you train a function f of x and you want that function f of x to produce y's. Okay, that's direct supervision, you know, from x's to y's. What are other ways we can we can set up this problem? One way is we train a function of f of x that produces something in the domain y, in the set capital Y. So we don't tell it what particular y we want. We just want it to be in the set of y's. Okay? And one example of this is generative adversarial networks. I'll give a, a brief overview. Uh, based on a paper we had a couple, uh, last year. Um, the colorization example that I showed, it, it had a lot of kind of a, uh, ways of, 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 of hacking it to make it look good. And some, what you want is you really want this white wall to be white in the back. But because we kind of tell, told it to, oh, you need to be more colorful, the wall becomes not white. Okay? So it's kind of overshooting it. And the, Annoying thing is that there is no way for the algorithm to look at it and say, that's just not looking realistic. You know, do something better. Make it better. Uh, have a, 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 try to optimize for things looking realistic. So we don't know how to do that. Well, actually, we do. So you know, for any kind of a problem we have, like colorization or super resolution or whatever, um, it would be nice if we had this function that would tell us, you know, make something realistic, kind of this loss function that's universal. It says, make, uh, make images look real. Uh, we do have that function right now. That's, co that's called the graduate student, okay? That's where the graduate student basically keeps hacking all the algorithm until, you know, enough of the pictures look good, and then, then we send it to, to publish. But it would be better if the computer were doing it themselves, okay? So one way that we, uh, we can do this 
is we can basically have somehow the computer send the resulting images to Amazon Mechanical Turk, ask a whole bunch of people if this is uh, good looking or not good looking, and then use that signal to update the algorithm. Very, very expensive, okay? But what, what we can do is we can use this idea that, that recently came out that kind of does something similar, okay? Because remember, we have a lot of real images. So what we could do is we can have another network that can act as, as an Amazon Turker deciding if something looks good or not, okay? And that network is basically going to tell us if the image that we generated, if it looks real, that is, does it, can you distinguish that image from a set of real images? And if the answer is no, that means that we are doing well. Okay, and this is the idea behind this generative adversarial models, uh, Ian Goodfellow and, and colleagues, uh, that, that has kind of really energized this whole field of, of image synthesis. Um, let's think about it, you know, what is it actually doing quickly? So we have our uh, function that uh, translates, say, from grayscale to color, okay? And now what we want is we want to add another network on top of that. And that network, we want to have it decide if the image here, if it, it looks real or it looks fake, okay? So what we want is we want G, the network G, to fool the network D. So we want D to think that this is a real image, whereas in fact it was generated by, by, by G, okay? And of course, D doesn't want to get fooled. So D really tries to, to figure out if it, can, if, if, it can, uh, if, if, if it can tell. And the idea is to basically have these two networks battle it out in a kind of a duel, like an arms race. And the idea with as just any arms race is, when you have competition, when you have a, a duel, both get better and better and better. That's, that's, that's the beautiful story of, of Gantz, right? So here is a little bit of math, so let's say that in this particular context, if we're trying to see what D wants to do, D wants to have a high probability for generated images. If an image was generated by G, we want it to have a high probability of saying that it's, it's a fake image, okay? Whereas if the image is actually a real image, then we want to have it say, no, this is a low probability that it was fake, okay? So we want to have a D such that it maximizes this quantity. Okay? At the same time, of course, what we want G to do is to do the opposite. It wants to minimize that same quantity, right? So D, G is going to get back signal from D that says, okay, I figured you out. And then G is gonna say, okay, let me see what I can do better now to improve my generator, generated image so that D will have a harder time. So maybe I'll do something that looks a little bit better, okay, and try to fool it. But of course, I don't want to fool just this particular D. I want to fool a, the best possible D. So this is where we get this whole uh, minimax formulation where you want to have the best D and then minimize the, the G to, 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 to do the best of that, okay? So one way to think about it is that now this D, you can think of it as a loss function. It's kind of like L1 or L2. Uh, it basically tells what you need to do, how do you optimize G such that it gets closer and closer to the goal. The only difference is that instead of being L2, now this D is learned. The D learns what does it mean to get closer to the goal for that particular problem. And what it means is that it basically means to be indistinguishable from the real samples from this, from this data domain, okay? So we're almost done, but not quite. Because here is an example, imagine that my G went completely crazy and started producing cats for any input image. It got it produced a cat, okay? Now, is this a real image or a fake image? It's a real image, it's a cat, it's, a, it's my student Junyan's cat, 
is named Aquarius, very nice cat. So it's a real image, but it's not really what we meant. So we need to give it a little bit more constraints. So basically what we want to do is we want to give D not just the generated image, but also the input X. So it can look at the pair of both of them together to say, is, it, is the G of X the result of starting with X? So that is, is this a real pair or a fake pair? And now we're all good. Now this is the conditional GAN case, and now we're, we're able to, to get it to work. And, and this is the, the final uh, thing that is being optimized. Now I'm, of course, hiding a, a whole bunch of things under the rug here. This is not a pretty optimization, as you might imagine. It is very complex complicated to optimize this thing, and, and, and there is a lot and a lot of work on trying to make it simpler. So far, it's still, it's, 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 it's more art than a science how to optimize this thing, but uh, my graduate students are really amazing at doing this, so, so we were able to get this working, and so now we can, we can you know, plug in grayscale and color pair, and then we can colorize images. We can do the, exactly the same code, we plug in, Google Street View and satellites, and then we can, you know, we can basically uh, hallucinate satellites from, from maps, or we can do it the other way around. Exactly the same code, but because the D is getting optimized for every different pair, it basically learns what is important for every domain. We can generate from labels, we can generate facades, we can go from day to night, we can go to, uh, from uh, thermal imaging to, to normal RGB imaging. We can take uh, edges, image edges and produce images that could have come from those things. Okay, this kind of looks cool, but actually it's not that complicated. Edge maps actually contain a lot of the information. The cool thing is that we can then train on this and test on just uh, you know, human sketches and even there, it's actually doing something reasonable, which is, which is quite, kind of neat. Um, and then uh, we, we put this online, the code online, and, and uh, a lot of kind of artists uh, decided to do cool things with this. And so this is, this is kind of a, a neat thing where you, you don't even need to do results of your papers anymore. You just kind of... Uh, post the code online and then just download results from, from that other people have done. Um, uh, and, and somebody even did a little uh, edges to cats uh, <laughs> thing. You can try it yourself. You, 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 you draw something, you hit the, this pix to pix button, and then it will get you get your cat. Okay, there you go. The, the, the best, the best uh, yeah, the best use of com computer technology uh, in my, at least from me, I don't know. This is, yeah, this is the, the pinnacle of my research career, I think. <laughs> I get lots of cats on the internet. Um, so, so this is an example of, of, uh, of uh, uh, GAN. So as, as a, again, we, we talked about direct supervision. A GAN basically says we supervise of, uh, not on the particular label, but on a set, why? <coughs> there are other types of meta-supervision we can think about. So one is uh, one of my favorite ones, it's cycle consistency, okay? The idea is that we don't know the answer why. We don't have label for that. But what we know is that if we, if we have our f of x, which produces some y, and then we apply a g of that, of that, we should get back to x, okay? And this is a constraint that people have used a lot, especially in tracking and computer vision. You track forwards, you get somewhere, you don't know where you are, then you track backwards in time along the video, and the idea is that you, you should end up where you started with. And if you don't, then something is wrong, okay? But we can use this as a constraint to, again, for optimization. So for example, let's say that we want to do this kind of a pix-to-pix, image-to-image translation, but we don't have labeled pairs. So let's say we want to translate from horses into zebras. 
right? There is no possible label data for this. So how do we do this? Well, we can take an inspiration from uh, actually Mark Twain uh, and the idea of uh, back translation in, 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 in language. And the idea of back translation is that if you want something translated in a foreign language you don't know, you hire one translator to translate to that language, and you hire another one to translate back into language you do know, and then you double check that it kind of still makes sense, right? And uh, Mark Twain wrote this book, uh, Jumping Frog in English, then in French, then clawed back into a civilized language once more by patient and remunerated toil. So here he was showing that in this particular case, the translation was not a good one, so he translated it back and, to, and, and showed that it was, it was, it was not, not looking good, okay? And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna basically do the same idea. We're going to now have a translator G that goes from domain X to domain Y, okay? And then translator F that goes back, okay? And, 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 and that's all. Now, because we, want, we don't want it to cheat and just stay where it is, we wanted to also have this adversarial loss, this, this, this GAN loss that says, that when you get to domain Y, you better be indistinguishable from a real thing in Y. And when you get to domain X, you better be indistinguishable from something real in X, okay? So what we are doing here is we're starting with an uh, uh, image X, we translate into a, a zebra domain. Again, we don't have a label for that, but we know that it should look like a real zebra, and then we translate it back, and then if we, didn't, if we don't get exactly where we started with, well, that's our loss. That's what we want to minimize. That is exactly this, the thing that we are going to want to minimize, okay? And if you kind of uh, step back and squint at this thing, what does it look like? It's an, our old friend, the autoencoder, right? You have the input, you reconstruct that input, the only difference is that it's an autoencoder that instead of a bottleneck, it just has a different domain in the middle. So it basically just has to go through something else. It's forced to go from some other representation and then come back. And then we'll also do it the other way around, okay? And so then we can turn horses into zebras and vice versa. We can even do it in, <laughs> in, in videos, just one frame at a time. The failures are kind of fun. I, I, I showed this uh, picture in Moscow last year, and I thought that's it, I, they'll not let me out, but they did. Um, we can also do kind of nice things uh, um, on going from uh, images to paintings, okay, by just kind of matching from domain of photographs to domain of, uh, in this case, uh, Cezanne paintings, and I'm particularly happy about those clouds. And you've probably seen a lot of this stylization uh, 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 papers and results. They usually look at a single, single image. They want to stylize for a particular image. Here we can take a whole domain. We can take all of Cezanne's painting, all a thousand of them, and learn the representation that kind of models the whole Cezanne. Okay, and, and the clouds look pretty nice. We can also go the other way around. We can go from a painting into something that kind of hopefully hard to distinguish from a real image. Now, if this was a perfect talk, this would also be Cezanne, and Cezanne didn't work. Monet is simpler, so, so I will show you Monet, but we're still working on Cezanne. Hopefully, we can get Cezanne too, okay? Uh, we can also apply this to translating between video games and the real world. So this is Grand Theft Auto, and this is tr making it look like Kitty. So now you can see it's like old German looking. Um, and you can go the other way around, which is even cooler. They kind of walking around with a, with with like make your reality like a video game. So here is an example of reality as a video game. Um, I can let me show you just because this is just such a cool, uh, such a cool result. Oh, this is this is again. People have been just tra playing around with with these things, all right. Oh no, it's not, uh... all right, never mind, it forgot.
This is like artists just taking our code and running with it. And, ah, uh, okay, I don't have the, I don't have the, let's see if we can get this EDROM. Ah, no, really? Okay, never mind. I will. I will. I will sh give give you the the pointer. Um, but yeah, finally, I want to show a very cu cute example of you know I in 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 my you know in my group we have been playing around with a lot of uh, making fake imagery from from early on. And so now a lot of people are worried about, you know, all this fake news and, you know, Putin screwing things up. Um, so we thought we could try to play on the other side of the fence as well and see if we can detect if image is not being realistic, okay? And the top one is actually from my old paper with James Hayes where we learned to kind of fill in holes and create these image composites. And here we can finally, you know, detect this and, and, and recover the, that this image was, was fake. And we are also going to do it with this, the same idea of, of self-supervision and meta-supervision. This is with a, a couple of uh, wonderful uh, former Berkeley undergrads and, and uh, uh, Andrew Owens. So given this image, it might, not, might look reasonable to you, but in fact, of course, it is fake. Uh, and how do, we, how do we detect this? Well, if we had enough fake examples, we can just again do this you know, supervised uh, direct supervision route, but we just don't have enough of these uh, positive examples. And so what we're going to do is we're trying to think about this as anomaly detection. So we're going to find, to see if we can learn if an image is consistent with itself. Okay, and the idea here is the following. We can look at a couple of patches of this image and we see, is there some sort of some kind of fingerprint in these, in these patches that tells us that they might have come from different imaging systems, that they are not from the same camera or not from the same image, okay? Um, now, if we had access to the actual images that this was taken from, created with, then we could actually look at the, the, the metadata that comes with the image, and then we can realize that it's actually, you know, the cameras are different, the, the, the focal length are different, et cetera, et cetera. But, of course, in real life, we don't have access to any of that. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna train an algorithm to see if for a pair of images, if, those images, if we can learn if a pair of patches comes from the same image or not. Now that by itself, you could also do that. That doesn't work as well because then, uh, again, you don't have enough, enough data for, to, for that. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna train if a pair of patches have the same inst metadata tag. There's a many different metadata, EXIF metadata tags, like camera brand, uh, focal length, JPEG compression, et cetera, et cetera. And for each one, we can predict not the value of the tag, but is it the same or is it different, okay? And so the idea is that we have a whole bunch of, we train it with a whole bunch of uh, real images. We don't need any fake images for this. So for every pair of real images, we take a, couple of random patches, and then we look at the EXIF tags that are similar in these images, and we train those things to say, okay, yes, those are similar, and the different ones we say, no, those are, those are different. So basically we train something like 80 different classifiers that says for every, different, for every single EXIF tag, is it going to be the same or is it going to be different, okay? And so now we have a kind of a way to establish if a pair of images, a pair of patches, are consistent along one of the dimensions. The dimension being, you know, are they, do they come from the same camera? Do they have the same resolution? Do they have the same JPEG? Et cetera, et cetera, okay? 
So here is the different uh, task, uh, tags and how well, the, how well we can predict uh, if, they, if they come from the same image or not. So you can say that the lens make is one of the top performing ones. So this is basically like the, the, what the, who produced the lens. Uh, then you have a custom render is basically some Apple iPhone thing. It basically says iPhone. Then, then, then you have a bunch of various things that really code for a different processing that's done by different cameras. So they're all kind of things that different cameras do differently. Whereas things like image date and time uh, or GPS coordinate are basically at chance level as you would expect, okay? And then what we do is we combine them all together. Oh, and we also have some other consistencies that are like try to do it like blurring and, and re-JPEGing, re et cetera, et cetera. And then at test time, here is an image, here is a manipulated image, and what we do is we just have a pair go and find a whole bunch of different pairs of images, and for every single XF tag, we can predict a map of if those two images are consistent or not consistent with each other, uh, these two patches, okay? And so we have a kind of consistency map for every single uh, uh, tag, like a camera or, or, or focal length, et cetera. And then we combine them together into an overall consistency heat map. And then once we have a heat map, we can, we can run normalized cuts and actually cut it into, into, into a, a, a thing or not. And so here we can predict that, oh, look at this. This is, this is, a, this is the inconsistent part. And here is, here is where it found the inconsistency is here. Here, actually, we didn't even notice it, but it detected that the, the shadow on the, on the floor was also painted in, uh, not just the guy on the top. Uh, naturally, nice, nicely, it works. It, it, you know, for normal images, it, it, it doesn't fire, usually, which is good. Um, and you know, we're beating most of the, pretty, pretty much all the, all the other methods. Uh, that are, have been supervised, we are beating them with this kind of self-supervised method. And for some images, we don't have the ground truth, so we don't know. So I don't know. Who knows? Maybe this is how conspiracy theories are, are born. Um, so I think I'm over time. There, um, so I, I, will, I, will, I will skip the last part, but uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, curiosity. Um, uh, one on one. So uh, I think, oops, uh, there you go. Thank you very much. So are there any questions for Alyosha? Actually, on the on the last part, mm -hmm. uh, detecting detecting fake images or manipulated images. So, uh, I would I wonder what would happen if you actually plug it into this GAN cycle, where you're trying to actually make uh, make one Im image look like it was taken with different optics with different camera, and then having this discriminator trying to discriminate it. Which of the sides would win eventually, if any? <laughs> so yeah, so in, I think in, in, in a longer, so I think what you are saying is what happens if you have the, 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 the critic, the guy who is trying to find fakes, uh, connect with the generator that m tries to make them better, right? And then have them battle with each other. Well, essentially, this uh, this idea came to my mind with this because there's yeah. this ongoing thing where people are trying to f find fake images, and then on the other hand, you're improving. The that's right. That's right. That's right. No, I, I think this is this is actually that that's that's what we are talking thinking about doing 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 next. This kind of to have the 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 fake detector not be a kind of a static one, but to 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 learn by having. A generator generate better and better fakes, and so hopefully then the detector becomes better and better and better. Well, the problem is that the technology to 
improve the detectors of fake is exactly the same technology that you will use to improve the producing of the fake images, right? That is, that is true, but at least for now, with these GAN formulations, in the end, so the, it, this is kind of a weird thing, that the GAN really the conver converges when the detector cannot know the difference between the real and the fake, right? So that would be when the, the thing actually converges. In reality, though, the detector always wins. So we, we cannot f uh, fool the detector. So those GANs never really converge. So for now, and, and it kind of may be reasonable because it's always easier to criticize than to create, right? Yeah. Always easy to be critic than a, than a, than a, than a painter, right? Um, so for now, that might be okay. But, but in general, yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's an arms race. It's an arms race and, and, uh, and yeah, there is, no, there, there is not going to be a perfect solution. There is always going to be something that uh, the generator can do that, that defeats the, the defenses. That's why I think it needs to be active. That's why the, 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 disc, the, the, the fake detector needs to keep thinking of some other ways that the generator could potentially be fooling it and, and be prepared for that. And if I may, just a mm -hmm. small technical follow-up. So many of these fake images are created by copying you know, patches of the same image somewhere else in that, in that image. Uh, is that something that this detector would be able to detect? Or? No, no. We, um, it, actually, we looked at this, and most of, those, most of the fakes are not copied from, from the same image, at least the ones that we have looked at. They're, they're usually, you know, you go, you find something on the internet, you put, you know, a picture of, uh, of, of the Pope or Putin or whatever, or Trump. Two purposes, either adding something into that image, right. in which case you will do exactly what you just yeah, said, yeah. or you want to remove something from that image, in which case... Yes, yes. So in this thing, we're basically, we're, we're focusing on what's called image splicing, where you have two sources and then you create an image out of those two sources. Uh, yeah, so if you, if you move things within the same image, it might still possibly detect things. We have seen a couple of examples where that happens of kind of the copy move thing, uh, because it, sometimes it screws up the, the JPEG compression, for example. But in general, it's not, it's not trained for that. It's not, it's, that's not what it, it's looking for. It's looking for really different imaging pipelines. Uh, so it's not, it's not supposed to be working for that, exam, for that thing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. It was, you raised very interesting questions. Um, I had a question about. Will you ask loudly? I don't hear it then close to. And... Sorry, sorry. Um, I, was, I had a question about your work on associating videos and sounds. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Not so much. I will, I will, I will repeat. Yes. Could you please? Um, and I was wondering if you try to work on videos with imitators that actually takes different voices, and so you will still have like the video, but uh, yes. So that was. Uh, so the question is, if we have tried it on on videos with people imitating other people, different voices, uh, we haven't. Uh, but I think this is this is yeah we can. Or any the, the the paper is online, the code is online, so anyone can actually run it and, and see. Uh, that would be an interesting thing to to run and see. We have uh, played with um, ving, 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 ventriloquists, so when you have a puppet and you talk as a puppet and then you talk as uh, as yourself, and it it kind of works. It kind of works for that. So uh, hopefully it should be it should be doing something like this. Yes, it's not. It's not meant to be uh, kind of a detect detecting, uh, detecting fakes. It's, it's really meant, it's meant to be fooled by the same things humans are fooled by. So if the impersonator is a good one, hopefully our method will work too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a question about this domain to domain uh, mappings. Mm -hmm. You had uh, like one directional and then a cycling thing. Mm -hmm. And you had, um, for example, uh, Google Maps in the one directional mm -hmm. 
but then uh, the paintings were in the cycle scene. Mm -hmm. So in the cycle scene, you care about the consistency that you come back to the same. Yeah. And you say the paintings were actually working only in one direction. So how, 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 how is that? Uh, no, no, no. The paint, they, the. The paintings work in both directions, paintings to, to, to photos, they just don't look so good. So I, 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 didn't, I didn't show the results that didn't, didn't work very well. Uh, okay, but maybe the question is then, uh, was it important, the consistency in these applications? Or, uh, so how much important was uh, enforcing the consistency for this site? So, so remember in the, in the Google Maps, you go to the Google page and you can you can copy you can you can you can you can copy the the Google map and then you switch to the satellite and you can copy the satellite of that same thing so you have aligned inputs and outputs right so this is a much simpler problem so there you don't need any consistency because you have the x and the y's given to you and so then you can just do it directly with the paintings and the, the photographs, there is no alignment. You have the Cezanne paintings and you have photographs and you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence. And so for that, the cycle is, is, is important. That's the, all, that's the only thing we have, basically. Where there is no other constraint. So then it's very important. Wait, wait, yeah. Can we come back to the colorization, for example? Okay. Then the colored image is not trained to the... Uh, to the uh, encoder network, oh, generator. It's, it, it is, it is, because there is a, there is a... Um... Yeah, I saw it was only gun. Hold on. Oh. So it's both. The, 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 the gun, yeah. So, so, let me see. Let me see, sorry. Da, 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 da. So, in this, in this setup, you are given the input and the output, okay? And you are, you're basically, where is the picture? You're training on the, the, the grayscale and the color, okay? So you're given the, 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 the input and the output and the GAN is just making sure that the output that the generator produces is similar in the perceptual space to what we humans expect, okay? Because if you don't have the GAN, then, then you get weird results like this one, right? The, this one, right? This is what happens if you just kind of do regression with, uh, say, something like L2 loss. So with, with GAN, you have both losses, this regression? Yes, yes. I, yeah, I, I, I did not mention that. I, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, it, it does have the, the kind of the standard L2 loss plus the GAN loss. Yes, you're, you're right. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I dropped out that, that slide. Yes, so for this, you have the, the L2 loss plus the GAN loss. In the second one with the cycle, we don't have in the L2 loss because there is no, there is no data for this. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, yes, this, good, good point, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a question over there. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm also curious about the method when you map the sound to the video and create mm -hmm. this heat map, because from my perspective, it learned uh, like a synchronization between the movement in the video and the, and the synchronization of the sound. That's right. So if the test image is like a people at a dance party and there are loudspeakers, so the heat map will be like a people movement because it's synchronized, but the producer of the sound is a loudspeaker. So it will like fail the system in this case. Yeah? It, because it, it's, it's a motion, it's like a motion, motion to sound, but you know, it's not a, like a true. It, no, it, it's, it's true. I think, I think it's, it's, it's not. It's not clear what heat map, what do you want to color? Because again, the, the, the producer of the sound, for example, when you're, when you're playing the, the, the organ, the producer of the sound is the big, uh, uh, the big uh, pipe mm -hmm. 
that's the thing produces the sound, but of course what, what it's being, it's, it's coloring is yeah. the guy play, pressing the keys. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, it's not a very clear what is it that we want. You know, do we want the actual physical thing that produces the sound or do we want the, 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 the actuator? Mm -hmm. And so here I think we are not, we're not, we just wanted to see what, what would it visualize. So we are happy with anything that connects with, with sound production in some way or the other. But yeah, it, it, you're completely right. It's not, I think, if, I think it's really, it's, it's going to be looking at correlations, not causations. And I think actually, I would be happy if the dance party thing, if it shows the people dancing, I think that would be actually pretty cool. Um, but yeah, you're completely right. It's not a, it's just kind of a, a type of, of visualization that, that shows, okay, this, these are the pixels that connect with the sound, mm -hmm. as opposed to pixels that don't connect with the sound, yeah. So last question, anyone? Please. I have a question. Uh, you motivated the talk by saying that the task for the network was too easy mm -hmm. when it was supervised. Then you continued like making it more and more harder, mm -hmm. but you also changed the task here. Yeah? So the yes. task is now just a transfer style or colorize the images or things like that. Uh, do you have some? And if I understand it right, with these approaches, you are still worse than if you try and supervise. Yes. So do you have some hints how to go back to the original task with this, this idea? Yeah. So the the question is, I, I think this is a very 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 good question that that. There was a little bit of a slide of hand. I said that you know the the, the tasks were the, the too easy, and the computers were easily cheating on the kind of the classification tasks. And then I ended up making task harder, but also changing the task to something like you know pretty pictures or uh, connecting audio and visual, et cetera, et cetera. What about going back to you know, detecting car, uh, detecting dogs and, and, and classification. So I think I personally am not a big fan of the classification task to begin with. I think it's a, it's a, it's a task that is designed to, to be cheated on because it's a task that basically assumes that you have a closed you have a closed world your world is a thousand classes and you're basically deciding one of the thousand things right so your 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 chance performance is actually not that bad your chance performance on on something like imagenet is uh, is uh, 1 in 1 in 200 right it's it's actually the chance is pretty high in the real world, we're in the open world, where the potential number of things that you need to recognize is, is almost infinite, okay? And so I think that actually a lot of the problems with, um, with, the, with, the, with, with, the, with the, these networks cheating is because we are testing them on tasks that are very constrained where cheating is actually the right thing to do. So we're testing them on something that is, um, that is not, uh, um, that, 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 is, that is a kind of a very, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a specialist task, right? What I think these methods will excel at is the generalist tasks, something where you train on something and then you, you, you apply it to something completely different and hopefully it will work better. And we have already seen this, like for example, the colorization uh, feature that we have trained, it does better than ImageNet if the task is, for example, then to predict depth from a single image, right? So if the task is very different from the task it was trained on, the self-supervised features work better. If the task is similar to what it was trained on, then the semantic tasks work better. So, I think that the, the big goal is that we want to produce a generalist computer, something that is able to deal with novel situations in a reasonable manner. Not something that we already have, if, if, if your goal is to just learn a specialist that will tell you know, different types of, uh, 
of, uh, of, 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 you know, um, of uh, Viennese pastries from each other. You know, you have a thousand different pastries and you want to tell, name all of them. Then I think the current direct supervision methods are exactly the thing you need to do if in this kind of closed world. But if you want to have a general algorithm that can do the pastries, it can do the flavors of gelato, or it can you know, tell Kupka from, uh, from Malevich, then the hope is that these kind of more general methods should get you a better way of doing this. So it's the difference between doing well on the exam versus doing well in the later life. Okay? Okay, so let's, let's finish uh, with this and let's thank Alyosha for excellent work today.